TII item 442, September 24th, 2017. iOS 11 for the masses. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, go Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. Today's episode is brought to you by RX Bar. For 25% off your first order, visit rxbar.com slash TII and use promo code TII at checkout. Today's episode is brought to you by Link AKC, which is an amazing new dog collar that has a GPS locator, activity tracker, and more. Go to linkakc.com and use promo code TII to save 30% on your order with free shipping. Welcome to the show. I'm your Rob, and you are listening to the Today in iOS podcast. First up, I want to thank Danny for sending in the artwork you see for today's show. Danny wrote the following. Hi, Rob. Here is a picture of my son, Spencer, in front of the Apple Store in Little Rock, Arkansas, about an hour and a half from where we live. You can see Spencer is in a wheelchair, and he deals with multiple medical issues. The Apple Store is one of his favorite places to visit. He has made a lot of friends and received a few gifts. In this picture, he's wearing his Apple Field Trip t-shirt, Apple USB bracelet, and a genuine Apple employee place card. Um, and his name is on it. This picture was taken a year or two ago when all the Apple staff used to wear those white place cards or name tags. I can't say enough good things about the staff in Little Rock store. When we go to the Apple store, it's like visiting family. Thanks for the podcast. Regards, Danny. Well, thanks, Danny, for sending in this picture. And folks, you can see this artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 442 or at Instagram.com slash Today in iOS and also at Facebook.com slash Today in iOS. Danny's picture continues to celebrate the 10th year anniversary of TII and the iPhone. Please, when taking a photo of yourself in front of your local Apple Store, if possible, make a square picture as I have to make them square for iTunes and put the Apple Store location on the photo along with TII or the Today in iOS branding. And thanks to the many of you that have already sent in photos. As always, send those pics to todayinios at gmail.com. And if you have some music you have created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email that to me and make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said music. I want to start right off by jumping into some listener feedback. It's going to be a lot in this episode, mostly listener feedback in this episode. First up in the email bag has this email. Hi, Rob. I increased my fanship of Apple when they created the ability to write on-screen Braille on phones, iPads, and iPod Touches. With the advent of the newest iPhone X, I question Apple. The company states its belief that access is human right. However, they said in the keynote that facial ID only works when an open-eyed person looks at the phone. I am a totally blind person lacking the ability to track visually. I know we are a niche within a small niche. Apple could state that we are such a small minority that locking us out of using this feature would not matter. However, they may have a workaround for us and others who may not be able to look at the phone for some reason. The workaround might be as simple as having to open the phone with the passcode. That would make the phone technically something we could use. I am keeping my 6 Plus S or 6S Plus and my iPad by Baby Pro and Mini. As far as I can tell, the new iPad Pro has mostly visual features. Also, the bigger the iPad screen, the harder it is to write Braille with it. That little finger needs to have a long reach. I hate complaining, and we'll stop now. Regards, Jan Brown. Jan, thanks for the feedback. On the last episode, I read a letter I wrote to Tim Cook about my concerns and the concerns of many like you, you Jan, have about Face ID and, and will it work for blind users who cannot look at the iPhone 10. And I received an email back from Apple. Tim Cook forwarded my email on to Colin at Apple, who is their accessibility guru. And we had a nice phone conversation about Face ID for those that are sight impaired or totally blind. And the long and the short is Apple designed the iPhone 10 from the ground up for accessibility. It was not something hacked on afterwards. If you are someone that was not going to get the iPhone 10 because of that, Colin, as a sight impaired user, said those fears will not be warranted. Uh, he would not say the specific features there are, but there was reports out there about uh, there's the option that when you're actually signing up with voiceover, 
uh, well, I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but there's a way where it, if you're setting it up with VoiceOver, it won't require you to look right at it. Those in the accessibility communities will be very happy with the iPhone 10 is the message I was received. And he said, again, the phone was designed from the ground up with accessibility in mind for all users. If you are about to buy an iPhone 8 Plus or an a iPhone 8, when you really wanted the iPhone 10, I would recommend you wait until the 10 is out to really see if it is or is not for you. I've, I'm sorry to say I've already heard of people saying they went and bought an 8 or an 8 Plus because iPhone 10 scared them off and didn't think it was going to be fully accessible. Folks, that's not it. Now, hopefully you didn't do that. If you did, maybe you want to go to your Apple store and see if you can return it now within the first 10 days and then hold off for the iPhone 10 to come out. Because if your reason for not getting it was accessibility reasons, that's not going to be a valid reason, again, based on my conversation with Colin at Apple. I plan to be talking with Colin more as we get closer to the iPhone 10 launch. And Colin, if you are listening, thanks again for your time on the phone. It is greatly appreciated to see that Apple continues to fully support all users with their products. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. I cannot see how the reachability feature will work with the iPhone 10 without the home button. Maybe blinking twice will work? Best regards, Paul. And Paul is talking about where on the iPhone 6 to 8 Plus, if you lightly tap and quickly tap on the home button, it will cause the screen to slide down, thus allowing you to do true one-handed use. Thanks, Paul, for your thoughts on this. And I have the same basic question on how will this work with no home button? Again, will be interesting to see what Apple implemented for the iPhone 10, but I'm sure they will have something implemented that will make sense. Maybe it's double tapping or triple tapping or something on the new larger power button, uh, but I'm sure they're going to have something that will make it easy for uh, reachability on the new iPhone 10. Hey there, Rob and fellow Today in iOS listeners. My name is Daryl. I'm in Tempe, Arizona. I'm an accessibility evangelist for the blind and visually impaired. I just wanted to call into the show to let everyone know that if you are a voiceover user who relies on Braille display support, especially if you are deafblind or you are blind with a significant hearing impairment where you absolutely re rely on the ability to read and write Braille on your device, then you definitely want to follow Rob's suggestions and avoid the iOS 11 update for now iOS 11 currently has a lot of Braille keyboard entry input issues, especially whether that actually whether that is on uh, the Braille display device or using the Braille screen input mode on the iOS device's screen itself. In either case, if you are a very fast Brailler or if you Braille more than about four or five sentences, then the cursor starts jumping around and it uh, it slows down and it starts to uh, lose characters. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this also is not a good update for blind students who rely on note-taking with their Braille display. Anyway, I just thought that everyone liked that uh, little gotcha there. Stay tuned. Avoid updating iOS 11 for now. This is Daryl with blindaccessjournal.com signing out. Thanks, Rob. Daryl, thank you so much for that feedback and for letting everyone know. And please, when that situation changes, when iOS 11 does give Braille support back and everything is working well on the Braille side, please let us know. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. I heard your letter to Tim Cook on your last episode concerning the use of Face ID with blind users. Please check out this blog. The writer explains how Face ID and the new iPhone 10 will work for voiceover users. Regards, Carlos. And thank you, Carlos, for the link to this. And as this article mentions, one of those accessibility features, which is where you can turn off Face ID to require your attention. So in other words, you still have Face ID, but it no longer requires your attention. And it is mentioned that this is automatically disabled if you have enabled voiceover during the initial setup. Again, more to come on the iPhone 10 and accessibility features in future episodes. Hi, Rob. I've attached a longish voicemail, around five minutes long, that you can cut this down as you may want to stick uh, just to my ordering information. I was on a long walk in the woods, so you'll hear some huffing and puffing. 
and even sound of a small bay babbling brook in the background. By the way, in inductive charging and cases in episode 441, don't forget that cases will decrease charging efficiency and some could pose overheating issues. Regards, Paul G. in Lawrenceville. And hi, Paul. Thanks for the voicemail. I'm going to stick the whole thing at the end unedited. And yes, uh, at the end of the whole episode, that is. And yes, different case materials will degrade the efficiency of inductive charging. But if they are leather or plastic, the amount it affects, uh, it's not going to be very noticeable. As long as they're not too thick, that is. Thickness will be a bigger issue here. And actually have a video linked in the show notes for Qi charging working through various materials. Your two biggest enemies to wireless charging are metals, which is basically kryptonite to wireless charging, and then thickness. So thin, non-metallic cases will work the best, without a doubt, when it comes to wireless charging. Hi, Rob. This is Ed from New Jersey. I am uh, new to your show and, quite frankly, new to iOS and to to, um, iPhones, as I was a long-time Android user. Uh, but I'm really enjoying getting caught up and, and, and all the helpful tips and, and information that you provide. I had a quick question for you regarding the uh, Apple recent Apple announcement for all their new products. Uh, I was surprised to see that Apple discontinued the Series 2 watch but kept the Series 1 watch uh, as an alternative to the Series 3, uh, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So I was curious what your thoughts were on that as to why they wouldn't ditch the Series 1 watch and keep the Series 2 as the low-cost alternative to the Series 3. Thanks again. Keep doing what you're doing. Have a great day. Bye. Ed, first, thanks for listening and welcome to the light side. For your question about the Series 2 versus Series 1, I want to put in this clarification on Apple Watches. So this, I know I've had some people emailing me about confusion about which watch is which and which one came when. So the Apple Watch original was not and is not the Series 1. The Series 1 is the second generation Apple Watch along with the Series 2. The key differentiators are Series 2 has GPS, Series 1 and the original did not. But the Series 1 processor is an upgrade from the original Apple Watch series or Apple Watch series one being a dual core S1P processor versus a single core processor in the original Apple Watch. Series three is the third generation Apple Watch and comes with an LTE version or a Wi-Fi only version. Currently on sale is the series one which does not have GPS and then the series three which is either LTE or Wi-Fi, and both have GPS, of the Series 3, that is. The original Apple Watch and the Series 2 have both been put to pasture, and that's all perfectly clear, right? Well, again, the key reason why they put the Series 2 to sleep and kept the Series 1 was the additional cost for the GPS and the antenna for the GPS and the chip for GPS. So this allowed them to keep the price as low as possible, or let me put this another way, This allowed them to keep the margins as high as possible and offer you two different versions, a lower cost version and then the higher cost version. And then the higher cost version of Series 3 goes way up when you get the ceramic price, which is crazy. It's crazy talk money. So Ed and everyone else, I hope that fully explains the generations of the Apple Watches and why we have the Series 1 and the Series 3 for sale, but no Series 2 nor the original Apple Watch. Maybe next time we'll get into why the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus are really the 11th generation of iPhones and the iPhone 10 is the 12th generation. I want to thank RX Bar for sponsoring our show again. As I mentioned previously, I've been eating protein bars for a long time and I am really, really enjoying my RX Bars. With my travel schedule picking up, it is nice to have something good in my laptop bag to eat on the go that actually tastes good. RX Bar decided to take a different approach to protein bars and make them only out of natural ingredients. And then they listed those core ingredients on the front of the package, like on my current favorite, chocolate sea salt, which has three egg whites, six almonds, four cashews, two dates, and no BS written right on the front. RX Bars come in 11 delicious flavors or varieties. As I mentioned, chocolate sea salt is my favorite, which is followed closely by blueberry then mixed berry and peanut butter chocolate. I like to keep a mix of bars with me when I travel around and 
here also around the house. And right now, if you look in my laptop bag, I, I actually just did. I've got one chocolate sea salt, one blueberry, and one mixed berry right in the bag. Our X bars are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free. There is no added sugar, no artificial colors, no artificial flavors, no preservatives, and no fillers. Turns out real food ingredients actually taste really good. Who would have thunk? Well, evidently, not those from the others that I've been eating for years. With RX Bar, you can actually taste the real fruit and the spices like the sea salt. Again, they are delicious and not what you think of when I say protein bars. For 25% off your first order, visit rxbar.com slash TII and enter promo code TII at checkout. Whether you like sweet or savory, chocolate or fruit flavors, there is an RX Bar for you. If you are looking for a great whole food protein bar made with 100% whole ingredients that tastes delicious, then once again, go to rxbar.com slash TII and enter promo code TII at checkout for 25% off your first order. Well, the benchmark scores are starting to come in for the A11 powered iPhones. The condensed version, it dominates the competition. And by competition, we mean other smartphone processors as they're really not competition. I have to put quotes around competition. They're no more competition than Governor Christie would be competition to Usain Bolt in the 100-meter dash. The A11 comes in with a single-core score of around 4,050. Samsung's own Exynos 8895 single uh, chip, their uh, single-core score is around 1,900. Higher is better, by the way. Huawei's Curran 960 comes in at 1880. Qualcomm's Snapdragon 835, used by most high-end Android devices, comes in at 1800. So yes, my Usain Bolt to Governor Christie joke might actually be a closer race than the other processors out there are to the A11. The A11 is actually even faster than the processor that is in the MacBook Pro 13-inch version that was released in 2017 for multi-core results and, uh, and right online on single core. Yeah, we actually have to resort to comparing the iPhone's new processor to MacBook Pros to get a close fight. Per the single and multi-core performance of the other smartphones, uh, let's just give one example. The Samsung S8 Plus had a single core score of 1,774 and a multi-core score of 6,113. The MacBook Pro 13-inch from mid-2017 had a single-core score of 4162 and a multi-core score of 9088. That is versus the 8 and the 8 Plus with the A11 coming in at 4061 for the single-core and 9950 for the multi-core. And so some multi-core tests above 10,000 for the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus. No matter how you slice it, the iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and 10 are the fastest smartphones, period, And to find a worthy competitor, you need to look at a MacBook Pro, not another smartphone like an Android device, because they're just going to get smoked. I said I had a lot of feedback for this episode, and I do. And thank you, everyone that sent it in. And I'm going to break that feedback right now into four different groups. Apple event feedback, then Apple pre-order experiences, then iOS 11 feedback, and then finally feedback on getting the new Apple products to line up with how things went the last two weeks. First, again, let's get into some of the Apple event feedback. Here we go. Hey, Rob. Justin from Pennsylvania. I was giving my reactions to the Apple event. Overall, it seems like, you know, of course, we all knew what was going on, but we all read the spoilers, so I guess that's on us, not really on Apple. It's hard to keep those secrets in. I'd have to say I found the iPhone 8 to be a strange uh, upgrade. It's kind of like the... Looks almost exactly the same. They add wireless charging. The True Tone display seems nice. Everyone says it's really nice um, on the iPad, so it's nice to see that come to the phone. And the iPhone 10 really uh, stole the show. I mean, you get that amazing-looking display and that uh, amazingly high, higher price tag. And I did agree with you that they definitely should have offered either the 512 gig for the higher end or at the least make the $1,000 version be 128 I think it's kind of chintzy that, you know, you're still paying $1,000. They can't, uh, they couldn't just bump you up to the 128 as the bottom line and then uh, take you up to the 
two fifty six for the other one if they're not going to give you the five hundred gigabytes. But um, all in all, uh, the watch looks really nice. Um, I mean, the fact that it's now can be more and more untethered from your device and streaming music with the cellular seems great. I don't like the ten dollar extra price tag. You know, carriers if they found a way to sniff out a few extra dollars, they do it. So. I don't see why it should be any different if you're using the same phone number, but, you know, hey, it's something they can charge you for. But all in all, I, I think it's pretty good. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I care about wireless charging, but I've never tried it. So, um, all in all, uh seems like you got some really good options out there to, to take your money. So, uh, thanks very much, Rob. I appreciate the show. Look forward to hearing your reactions when you get your iPhone 10. Thanks. Bye. Justin, thank you for your feedback. Into the email bag we go. Hi, Rob. I wanted to send my thoughts and feedback regarding the Apple event. I apologize in advance for the lengthy email. First up, Apple Watch. I am currently using the first generation Apple Watch. When the second generation came out, I was enticed by the swimming capability as I enjoy going to the pool with my family, but I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger. I couldn't see enough reason to upgrade knowing a third generation would be announced. Now that it has, I can say I would like a third gen, but not cellular. The only benefit for me would be the immediate access to Apple Music, but not enough to sway me. The non-cellular third generation will offer everything I'm looking for in an updated watch. The only obstacle is convincing my wife that it is a need over a want. For the iPhone, this is where I was most let down. I am on what you might call an S-cycle update, where I upgrade my phone on the S releases, 4S, 5S, and currently 6S. I was hoping to see a typical S jump for the 7 and a groundbreaking revelation uh, revelation of a new phone. In my opinion, the 10 is a beautiful blend of technology, but I cannot justify $1,000 on a device that will be replaced in a year and obsolete in two. 1000 plus on a laptop is one thing, but in my own opinion, too much for a phone. As my success is working great, I may just wait until 2018 and see how the iPhone 10 affects the, st- the mar- smartphone market. Per Apple TV, I love my 4th gen Apple TV. My wife loves the 4th gen Apple TV. My kids love the 4th gen Apple TV. 4K is awesome. And when I need a new Apple TV, I'm sure I will pick one up. I won't be running out to snag one this holiday season. I would say that I was not overall blown away by this event, but I was a little excited about what was announced. To me, it seems like Apple is trying to test a new approach to successful products in an attempt to stimulate innovation. I believe Apple has only scratched the surface of augmented reality. Regards, Brenton Nybauer. Well, Brenton, thank you very much for your feedback. Hello, Rob. It's Justin from Pennsylvania again. I wanted to give one more reaction to the slight little update to the AirPod. Adding an induction case. I guess my question is, I've seen the mixed reports. Have you heard anything for sure that you'll be, if you're a current Air owner of AirPods, if you can buy the wireless charging case, that will eventually go with the Air Map later on. And I guess I was surprised that they gave such a little, such a small update to AirPods, if they were an update them at all, considering they have never been in regular stock since their release. Being someone who is currently making this call on AirPods now, they are absolutely the only way I listen to stuff from my phone anymore. And I'm glad that my new AirPods, my AirPods I have really only are missing wireless charging as a feature. But it would be nice to be able to add that feature by getting the case. I guess, uh, you know, because I don't really need new earphones yet. So I guess I was... Uh, just wondering if, you, if anyone in the community actually has heard something official on that. I can't, you don't really get a good idea for it on the website, but I could tell. I guess that's sort of a question I have for it. And other than that, uh, I don't think they need to do a lot more, but I would love to see another idea they could have for them. I'd love for them to be able to somehow be able to hear Hey Siri through the, um, I go, sorry, H E Y Siri through the, them without having to tap them. That would be nice, but um, I don't know if the battery life would allow that. But uh, thanks a lot, Rob. I know I've caught a lot this week, but I really like the show, and I'm very excited for the new Apple products. First off, Justin, never apologize for dialing 206-666-6364 or sending your voicemail in via todayinios at gmail.com. We want your feedback, so thank you very much for sending it in. 
Per your question about the wireless charging case for the AirPods, yes, they will absolutely work with the first generation AirPods. Not that they've even announced the second gen yet, but the AirPods will work with the new case and it is $69 for the new case. And back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. I could sum up yesterday's Apple event in one word, underwhelming. So many questions. Why keep the Series 1 Apple Watch and get rid of the Series 2? Uh, just quick here. Go back a few minutes. Uh, answer that. Um, why not offer the Apple TV with more storage? Good question. Why call the iPhone iPhone 8 and 8 Plus and not simply iPhone 7S and 7S Plus? They obviously... This obviously was not a huge update to the iPhone. Like you said, maybe not even big enough to give it the S name. And then why skip 9 altogether and go to 10? I get it. It's the 10th anniversary and they've skipped numbers in the past and no iPhone 2 straight to 3G. But things are starting to get confusing with the names of these phones. And this iPhone 10 looks like the original 2G iPhone and a two-year-old Samsung Galaxy that had an ugly baby together. And let's not even get into the fact that they can't figure out what ports they want to use across all devices. Is it USB-C, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, etc.? Hopefully, they can at least stick to the lightning cable for a while. I also found it strange they weren't able to come up with their own wireless charging pad in time for the release of these new iPhones. They hinted at a concept, but really just gave Belkin and other companies publicity and sales because they didn't figure it out in time. Is Apple trying to do too much at once? Releasing two game-changing products is more effective than five mediocre updates. Either way, this may have be the first year in many years that I'm not upgrading my device, despite the fact that I'm one of those yearly trade-in on one of those yearly trade-in plans. As much as I would like a plus-size phone, I think I might have to stick with my 256 gigabyte jet black iPhone 7 until it's paid off and then sell it when the iPhone 18 comes out next year or whatever else they call it. Thanks for the show, Rob, and for letting me vent. P.S. The info coming on sales, I've been really wanting an Apple Watch, but uh, was waiting to see what happens with this year's announcement. Now I know I want the Series 2, not the Series 1, because I need to be able to go on a run and leave my phone at home. So please let us know if you find any good deals like you always do. Thanks in advance. Regards, Aaron McVeigh. Well, Aaron, thanks for the feedback. I'm sure there's going to be some overstock or even... I would even look in Apple's website for some, uh, what do they call it, a refurbished unit. So maybe you could find a refurbished se uh, Series 2 Apple Watch for sale. And there'll be some other people that are purging stock, so keep an eye out for that. That said, you may want to just look at the Series 3 Wi-Fi, and that way you can, if you don't want to sell you a part, you can at least go for a run. You'll have GPS. It'll be waterproof. You can swim with it. But if it's more about price, then yeah, then you're just going to need to look for a good deal. And, and if some of those come up and if other people see a good deal on the Series 2 Apple Watches out there, please let us know. And we'll share it with the audience. Hey, Rob. This is Darius from West Virginia. I wanted to comment on something about the Apple Watch. Back when the original Apple Watch shipped, it had a composite back. And that composite back irritated both mine and my wife's wrists. Series 2 brought the ceramic back. Well, the only way you can get a ceramic back with a new Apple Watch Series 3 is if you get LTE. They went back to the composite back for the Series 2 or Series 3 Apple Watch. And since I don't want to spend $120 extra a year, and I also don't like the red dot on the crown, I'm going to just sit it out with my Series 2. Hope that you have a good day. Thanks, Rob. Bye. Darius, thanks for the feedback. First note, it's not 120 more. You don't have to do the LTE. You don't have to sign up. You can choose not to enable the LTE. So you could get it minus having to pay the extra $10 a month if you wanted that one. Per the red dot, I guess I'm the only person that likes the red dot because everybody else seems to send in feedback negatively about the red dot. I like it. I think it's fine. Uh, definitely lets you know 
if it is a newer device and if it's LTE. I guess Apple's official announcement is it's LTE, but my official announcement is it's so Apple can let their users, let people know they've got the new Apple Watch. Hi, Rod. It's Kim from Salem, Oregon. I just wanted to give you my thoughts on the Apple event. It was awesome. Wow. Oh, wow. The uh, Series 3 Apple Watch was um, amazing with the whole cellular connectivity and everything. That's great. I'm still going to stick with the Series 1. Or, I mean, I have the Series 1. I'm going to stick with the Series 2 when uh, my Series 1, you know, dies. And as far as the iPhone goes, iPhone 8, that's nice. iPhone 8 Plus, it's too big. The iPhone 10 is too big as well. However, when the iPhone goes down in size, like in, in a generation or so, when they can get all the kinks worked out with Face ID and everything, I am definitely interested for the small version of the phone, whatever number that's going to be. Anyway, it's really cool. And um, I'm looking forward to definitely look, go to the Apple Store and check in one out. So uh, that will be awesome, especially with the uh, face recognition and everything. So I will talk to you later. Bye. Kim, thanks for your feedback. Now we're going to get into some of the feedback from Apple pre-order experiences for different listeners. Hi, Rob. Ordered both items at 3.02 a.m. and both are scheduled to arrive on the 22nd. Thanks, Bob Anderson. And I should say thanks to Bob because Bob emailed me right at that moment and I was sitting there working on emails, totally oblivious to the time and had forgot to set my alarm. And I saw Bob's email come in, pop up on my notification and I went, oh, I got to go order my Apple Watch and Apple TV. And I did. And then I sent out notifications. So anyone that got the notification from me about going to pre-order should thank Bob because Bob reminded me. Otherwise, I might have been there for another half an hour working on the emails. I would I totally spaced the time I was at. Uh, also from Rob, he wrote, um, hi, uh, ordered my Nike Plus GPS Plus cellular 42 millimeter space gray with uh, anthracic black Nike sport band watch at 3.02 a.m. Eastern time showing an estimated delivery of October 5th. Yeah, the Nike ones are longer. Love the show and have since you started. Keep doing what you're doing. Regards, Brad Garfinkel and Harrisburg, PA. Well, Brad, congrats. And hopefully you'll get your Nike watch here um, end of next week. I did hear from uh, other people that ordered the Nike one that was delayed as well. Hi, Rob. This is uh, Dave uh, calling from California, San Diego, California. I was actually calling to give you an update on my experience with uh, my current purchase of my Series 3 Apple Watch. So last night, I was one of the first. Uh, the store for me was up and running literally at 12.01. Uh, so I was able to just swoop in fairly quickly. I knew what I wanted, the uh, cellular GPS space gray black band put it in the cart, and uh, went on about my merry way. The ship date is September 22nd, so it's going to be on a Friday. Hopefully I get it then, uh, and, and I'll be looking forward to using it. I'm a Series 2 user now, and uh, I just really just wanted that upgrade for the cellular and the, uh, the, you know, the, the freedom of having it on my phone. But the second reason for my call, something that's really ironic, and it may go towards the popularity of this year's iPhone. If you go on to uh, to try to pre-order your 8 Plus or your 8, the delivery date at this moment at 8.39 Pacific Standard Time is still Friday the 22nd. If you try to put one of your Apple Watches into your basket, it's 2 to 4 or sometimes even 3 to or 2 to 4 or sometimes 4 to 5 weeks for your Series 3 Apple Watch. But for the iPhone, for both of them, it's saying that the pre-delivery or the, the delivery date is going to be Friday, September 22nd. I don't think that's good for the iPhone 8. I know that you might have a difference of opinion. I can't wait to hear it, but I think that's a sign. I'm sticking with my 7 Plus. I didn't think that they really took it far enough this year. I was really hardened to know that or to, to see that. But again, I, I'm, I'm just interested to see what you have to say. Uh, thanks a lot for the show. And thanks a lot for all you do. All right, bye. Dave, thanks for your feedback. And per your question and what my thoughts are on the 8 and 8 Plus and sales and that, well, they've sold out in most locations by now. But 
you have to look at it. This isn't the flagship unit. The flagship unit that was announced was the iPhone 10. The people that do the most pre-ordering are, are the people looking for flagship units. And as I said previously on the show, I didn't see where the 8 and the 8 Plus made a lot of sense if the iPhone 10 had hit all the specs that people were talking about, which it did. I mean, it's pretty close in size physically to the iPhone 8, but it's bigger than the iPhone 8 Plus for the screen. So the real differentiator that Apple put between the three devices is price. So outside of price, when you look at it, the 8 and the 8 Plus don't make much sense spec-wise, hence why a lot of the true fanboys, and I'm not saying you're not a true fanboy or fangirl if you bought an 8 or 8 Plus, but why the people that are the most likely to be pre-orderers are holding off um, is because the iPhone 10 is out there. So my feeling is the iPhone 10 is going to be the one with all the shortages, and we're not going to see um, supply equal demand probably until the end of the first quarter at best of 2018. So I think we're going to go a long time with shortages on the iPhone uh, 10. So if you want an iPhone 10, you best pre-order that on that first night in the first few minutes, because if you don't, you probably are not going to see it until 2018. Into the email bag. Hi, Rob. Really enjoyed your timely update of the Apple special event this week, uh, TII episode 441. And thanks very much for sending the alert worldwide via the TI app, announcing the Apple store was open for pre-orders this Friday, 9.15. I'm located in Penshurst. Uh, it's near Sydney, Australia, and the Australian Apple Store also opened for orders at the same time as the U.S., 12 a.m. Pacific equals 5 p.m. local time in Australia, Eastern Coast. On 9.15, I pre-ordered an Apple Watch Series 3, 38 millimeter, with GPS and LTE, stainless, and the Milanese Loop, and Apple Care. And then the stated delivery date to my home in the southern suburbs of Sydney is on Friday, September 22nd, 2017, initially. At 12.01 a.m. Pacific time, the Apple Store did not seem to be taking orders when accessed via my work PC with Internet Browser. However, I quickly switched to the Apple Store app on my iPhone SE where it had much faster response and my order was finalized by approximately 12.04 a.m. Pacific time. I was interested in the Apple Watch Series 3 not only for its standalone LTE and eSIM features, but particularly for the heart monitoring feature that Apple is developing as a survivor of aborted sudden cardiac uh, death, cardiac arrest in Hawaii during the mid 1990s, and having a series of implanted defibrillations uh, since that time, you may imagine why I'm interested in this new series of watches and arrhythmia monitoring algorithms being developed by Apple in conjunction with the Stanford Medicine. It seems they will provide some real time information and trends to the wearer at a glance. I do wonder how far the sensing technology can be developed for sensors on the watch alone, but are keen for support to support and test it out and follow this line of products as they evolve. With announcements like the one given by Jeff Williams at the special event, I can see the market for this watch expanding rapidly in the year ahead. This will be my first Apple Watch. Thanks again for the great source of TI. Regards, David Vaughn, Penshurst, Sydney, Australia. David, thank you for your feedback. And yes, that heart monitoring uh, feature is one that I turned on immediately. As soon as I, that was one of the first things I turned on when I was setting it up was that so that I could see the my heart rates and see how it goes. And so there's some really neat features and you get to see kind of a neat pattern of your heart rate when it goes up and when it goes down. So clearly that was one of the new features that really encouraged me to at least upgrade from the original Apple Watch to the new Series 3. Rob, it's Brent out here in Oklahoma City. I want to say thank you as you saved me. For some reason, I had it in my head that the iPhone pre-orders were actually Saturday morning at 2 a.m. and not Friday morning at 2 a.m. And so I uh, went to bed as usual on Thursday without any plans of getting up. And I just happened to wake up at around 4 a.m. I looked at my phone saw your pushed out message that the iPhones were now on sale, jumped over to the Apple Store app, 
and was able to get my iPhone ordered with the delivery date of still September the 22nd. So um, I ended up getting the silver 256 gig version on Verizon. So I definitely appreciate the pushed message because if not, who knows, I might not uh, be getting my iPhone on the 22nd like I was hoping to. So thanks again for that message. And I have a question for you that's kind of off that topic. Whenever I do a reset network settings on my iPhone, it, like it should, resets the Wi-Fi and you have to go back in and put your password in. But it also resets the Wi-Fi on my iPad. And I have to go in and click on the Wi-Fi network and put the password back in on the iPad as well. Do you know why that does that? And is there a way to make it so it doesn't do that? It just seems really strange that it actually carries over to a completely different device. So if you have any idea about that, I would sure appreciate it. Anyway, thanks again for the uh, heads up messages and thanks for helping me to get my iPhone on time. Next year, I guess I will pay more attention and so forth. So have a great day and uh, hope you get your iPhone 10 in a timely manner here in a couple months. Take care. Brent, thank you so much for the feedback there. And for your question at the end, I'm not sure why it's doing that. It doesn't do that for mine. Probably some sort of sync setting. Maybe you have them uh, synced on some iCloud sharing of uh, passwords. If anyone has had that same effect where they have done the reset network settings and it resets it on all their devices and then found a solution to that, please give us a call 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOON-DOG or shoot an email to todayinios at gmail.com. Hi, Rob. I ordered an Apple Watch Series 3 silver aluminum case with Fog Sport Band. I ordered as soon as the store came back online at 8.01 Greenwich Week time, and my delivery is the release day this Friday, the 22nd. I have had every series of Apple Watch, but this is the first time I've not gone for a steel case. I do love the steel cases and have found it very durable, but I found it hard to justify the price, especially as my dad is buying it for me on my birthday and the condition that I give him my Series 2 in return. I also did not go for the 4G LTE version, not because of the extra 70 pounds for the watch itself, uh, that feels quite reasonable to me, but because of the extra money the carriers charge, the extra 7 pounds a month, also my carrier O2 does not offer, uh, even offer it yet. So my dad was in luck, the watch I wanted I also was also the cheapest, uh, which must be a first for me. Tim Cook does not need to worry too much as I'll soon be back to my normal spending habits in a few weeks' time when I ordered the 256 gig iPhone 10 in silver. Wish me luck on that delivery date. <laughs> what do you think? January? Regards, Mike from Telford, England. Well, Mike, thank you, and boy, I really hope the delivery date you get it around November 3rd, which is going to, is supposed to be the delivery date for the October 27th, I think it is, uh, pre-order date, we'll talk more about that as we get closer to it. But right now, the initial dates they're saying is November 3rd. Hello, Rob. It's Justin from Pennsylvania. I thought I'd leave a message now that I've had some time after the Apple event. Um, I wanted to, I was kind of thinking about the react towards your, uh, the way you were talking about the iPhone 8, which I think it's one of those weird upgrades where when you look at it on paper, um, side by side, the iPhone 10, they're actually very similar. Um, honestly, the upgrade's really very similar. I think the, the thing that you're looking at is, you know, if you're very price sensitive, I don't know if iPhones, the phone you normally go for anyway, but um, if you want to stay in the iPhone universe, the iPhone 8 does give you uh, almost everything the 10 does, minus the, the crazy screen and crazy front camera stuff. Other than that, I think it's actually a very solid upgrade. I know you were kind of saying, telling people even if you're on the iPhone 6S, you might not want to upgrade, which you might not, because I, I guess my question is, do you think the iPhone 10 is the future of all the iPhones coming out? Like, that they're all going to be OLED. I think that's the going rumor that people have been saying. But uh, basically, I just wonder, you know, especially with that notch 
and people seem to complain about it, but I guess people complain about everything when it comes to iOS until they have it in their hand and then they just get used to it. I guess I was just wondering, is the screen really the biggest thing on the phone or is it something that is just uh, window dressing on it? Um, because if you kind of look at it, that the iPhone 8 actually has the same look that they've had for quite a while now. But yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of talk myself in a circle here, but I guess what I was looking at is that these are phones that are very similar, but the, the things that really add the cost is the screen and the camera on the front. But uh, I don't know. I, I think it's uh, one of those weird times where now that we're a couple of days in the pre-order, the iPhone 8 is still pre-orderable. And I just wonder, is everyone going for the 10? Can they make enough? Will this be one of the first products that they'll just have to cut off? Because I just wonder, like, is there going to be enough iPhone 10s to go around? Because the demand for the 8, they seem to be able to keep up with. So I guess I know they're selling a lot of them, but I just wonder, are people all holding out for the 10? Because um, that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. So I know I had like three messages at once here, but thanks a lot, Rob. I appreciate the show. Have a great day. Justin, thanks for the feedback. And yeah, I do think a lot of people that would normally pre-order, the people that would wait online, a lot of those folks are holding off for the iPhone 10. And yeah, also the difference between the 7 and the 7 Plus and then the the 8 and the 8 Plus, respectively, the, the differences are very minimal. You added inductive charging, you put a glass back on it to allow for the inductive charging, hence why you had to go from the 7 name to the 8 name. But it, it wasn't a full S upgrade, uh, not overall. So, uh, yeah, I think people are holding back for that reason. And then again, the iPhone 10 is going to attract a lot of the fanboys, a lot of the folks that wait online uh, and have to have the latest and greatest. Uh, it's a little pricey this year. Okay, a lot pricey this year. But I do think you're going to see um, pretty good demand for the iPhone 10 when it's all said and done. I want to thank Link AKC for once again sponsoring the show. Link AKC makes a great GPS collar for your dog that is backed by the American Kennel Club. But it is more than just a GPS locator. It is also a temperature monitor, activity tracker, flashlight, and more, all controlled through an app on your smartphone. The GPS locator gives you the peace of mind about your furry friend, its location, and it also lets you know if it is getting too hot or cold for said friend. Having it now for about two months, the part we look at every day is the activity monitor. Link AKC also shows the exact amount of activity every dog needs, and you can track how much your activity your dog is getting with total activity broken down to moderate and high intensity, You can set a goal for your dog, and it lets you know when your dog has hit that goal. It's, again, like the activity monitor on your Apple Watch, but for your dog. We find that if Spock, um, our dog, does not get at least an hour of activity a day, at the end of the day, he has way too much energy and basically just wants to eat the kids, or at least try to eat their shorts. He starts jumping on them, and he's wanting to play. And that means, come the end of the day, we know if we need to take him for another walk. And that leads to one of my other favorite features, the built-in flashlight. You can easily turn on and off the flashlight from your app on your phone when we take Spock for walks in the evening uh, to help burn off that extra energy that he hadn't reached yet, his goal. This lets us turn on the flashlight so he can see and we can see where we are going and what is on the walking path in front of us. And not only is it functionally a great collar, it is also a great looking collar because as we iPhone users know, it is so, so, so much about the look. Link AKC is super comfortable and it looks great on Spock. Keeping your dog safe, happy, and healthy just got even easier with this special offer from Link AKC. Go to linkakc.com and use code TII to save 30% on your order with free shipping. That's code TII to save 30% on your order with free shipping at linkakc.com. That's L-I-N-K-A-K-C.com, promo code TII. Hi, Rob. It's Steve calling from L.A. Quick technical question on the iOS 11 update. I have the iPad Pro 9.7, and I'm trying to do slide over, and I'm having a very difficult time. 
Uh, when I launched the second app, it's filling up the screen. It's not allowing slide over. Did some research online. I found that some uh, of the applications are limited on the iPad Pro 9.7, but I can't believe this would be one of the limitations. I'm at an i. I'm at an Apple store right now. It happens to be opening day of the uh, launch of the uh, 8 and the new uh, watch. Uh, by the way, on that, there's about 13 people online, just as an FYI. It's about 12.30 Pacific time. Uh, no one in the store uh, is aware of the problem. They said it should work, but no one has an answer. Wondering if you or some of the listeners can help me out on that. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Steve, thanks for the feedback. And I haven't seen that issue, but maybe I haven't checked the right apps or wrong apps, as the case may be. If anyone has seen this issue, iOS 11, let us know, 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moon Dog, or shoot an email to todayinios at gmail.com. Hi, Rob, listening to your latest episode, and I did the iOS 11 public beta on my iPad Mini 4 and my newly acquired iPhone 6S. Yeah, I finally got another iPhone. The 3GS died in December 2015 and haven't been able to get another one. I installed the final iOS 11 this morning on both. Don't want to jinx it, but they're both fine. The only thing I don't care for is the control panel. You turn off Wi-Fi, it disconnects Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi is still in the settings. I guess they do that so that you can connect to a different access point without going to settings, I guess. Updated my MacBook Pro from Mavericks to Sierra. It was fine until I downloaded and installed the 2 gigabyte update. Now it's stuck on the Apple logo. I reinstalled Sierra, but no luck. Anyways, glad to have an iPhone again. Regards, Joe and Cebu. Well, Joe, sorry to hear about the issues with your MacBook, and hopefully you've since worked those out. All right, let's jump into some voicemail. Hey, Rob. This is Lee from Portland, Oregon. Um, I like iOS 11, and I updated my watch and my phone, but I work all night long, and I listen to podcasts. It's, the thing that's really annoying me is I'm left-handed, so I have my watch on my left side, and they've changed the dial to where if you're swapping from one podcast to another, say I'm done with your podcast, and I listen to another podcast, the watch automatically pulls up the podcast app within the watch and I want it to stop because as I'm moving my wrist my jacket is turning the crown which is hearing the beep 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 from turning up or down the volume and I've looked in the phone I've looked in the watch I cannot find out how to tell the watch to forget all about podcasts I just want to shut it off thanks so much and I enjoy the show Lee, thanks for the feedback. I, I don't know why you don't just set your watch up so that the crown is facing out away from your wrist or, you know, out towards your fingers. You can set it on either wrist to be pointing out away from you. So my suggestion would be reset your Apple Watch so that the crown and the button are on the outside, not on the inside. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. One major addition to iOS 11 for me is the ability to type to Siri. I lost the ability to speak, so Siri was basically sitting in my phone sleeping all the time. I wrote Tim Cook and Apple Accessibility over two years ago requesting this feature. I also remember writing you saying this was a needed feature. I was amazed that I actually received an email from Apple about six months ago saying that my accessibility request had been sent to the iOS development team for implementation. After all that time, they saved my email and informed me. Pretty cool. If anyone out there can't speak on their own, I made the app Talk For Me, Talk To Speech. It is a full featured TTS app and a gift to anyone unfortunate enough to need it. It uses Apple's enhanced quality voices. It's fast and simple. I use it every day and constantly try to improve it. Just search for Talk For Me, Text To Speech in the App Store. Regards, Darren. Well, Darren, thanks for that feedback. It was Great to hear a story where Apple replied back even after all that time and did, did take your issue into account and actually got a solution for you and, and came back and let you know, you know yours was one of the reasons they did it. And also for creating the app Talk For Me. So hopefully that will help some folks out. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes, of course. Good morning, Rob. Hey, it's Shannon in Arizona. I just let, finished listening to episode 441 and wanted to give you a few comments about iOS 11. I signed up for the public beta. I had signed up in the past, 
but uh, had got out of it. But anyway, I wanted to just feel like I couldn't wait. So I signed up when uh, Public Beta 9 came out. And it had a few bugs, nothing I cared to report, just more uh, nuisances. I reported a couple back to Apple, and everything seemed fine. However, last night when I got home, this was the night of the 12th, September 12th, uh, I checked and it said that iOS 11 was available. So I downloaded it, and I'm assuming that's Goldmaster, and why it's early? Is it just because we were on public beta, maybe? I don't know. But I know I saw a few forums that said it wasn't coming out until the 19th, so... I'm not sure why I got it early or why some people did, but either way, I downloaded it last night and no changes that I can tell. The few bugs that I reported to Apple don't seem to be there. So one of them was uh, like when I would, when the phone was asleep and I would push the sleep wake button, it would wake up and the screen would light up, but the clock wasn't there. So again, nothing big, but I don't remember what the other one was right now. Oh, maps kept crashing. Maps crashed on me quite a bit and I use I drive locally around Phoenix, Arizona, so I use maps a lot, and uh, it would crash about 30 to 40% of the time. But again, it would open right back up, still have all my saved data, so it was just more of a nuisance, nothing major. Anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks, man. Talk to you later. Bye. Shannon, thanks for the feedback. And yep, they let everybody that was a beta tester get access to the Goldmaster on the 12th. So that was a nice little thing there where we got it a week early, but I'm sure it was more so that Apple could get some good feedback to see if there was any issues before they went to the masses. In any case, uh, it was nice to get the Goldmaster on the 12th. Back to the email back. Hi, Rob. Thanks for the show. I listen all the time. One question. I currently own a 7 Plus and I plan to buy the 10, which is the same boat I'm in. Should I download iOS 11 to the 7 Plus now or wait until the 10, assuming iOS 11 will already be on that device. Does it make any difference? Regards, Rob. Uh, Rob, we'll talk about what you should do at the bottom of this section. So when I get to the end, I will make my recommendation. Hi, Rob. Throwing question to the wind. I successfully upgraded last night to iOS 11. It's beautiful. Regards, Thomas. Well, congrats, Thomas. And I'm glad to hear you didn't have any issues. And let's get into some voicemail feedback here. Despacito, slowly. That's what my friend Justin Bieber from Canada says. And what does Rob from America say? Slowly, don't upgrade to iOS 11 just yet. But I'm in India and throwing caution to the winds. At 10.30 Pacific time, I started downloading iOS 11 and updated it. Of course, I followed all of Rob's advice regarding putting off all working applications, resetting network settings, backing up, etc., which he's told us so often and which we remember well. So having done that, I can say now, after using it for more than a day, I don't regret it. It was really a good update and it's really working well. And frankly, it has fewer bugs than most other iOS updates till date. And I've been updating from iOS 4 onwards. So I think if we have to be today in iOS, we have to update to iOS 11. Otherwise, we might end up calling this podcast yesterday in iOS. Sorry, Rob, no offense. I'm saying it just because I feel so strongly that I have faith in Apple. You have faith in Apple. You buy an Apple iPhone for a thousand bucks and then you don't want to update to the latest iOS? Anyway, one other point Emergency SOS. If you have to update to iOS, I would recommend you do it just for this one feature. Emergency SOS. Amazing thinking by Apple. Click on the, emer- uh, on the uh, power button five times quickly and it starts, it sends an emergency message to 911 with your location and to all the contacts which you have put in in your health app. And I tried it. It worked wonderfully. It's called emergency. It sent messages with my location to all my contacts 
which I had put in the health app. And best of all, with my locked iPhone, it brought my medical ID record on the home screen. And so that if I was in a real emergency, anyone who picked up my phone would know my name, my health record, everything, so I could get the best assistance as soon as possible. I think just for this one feature, you should Apple uh, upgrade to the iOS 11. And so what if Justin Bieber says slowly, or if Rob says, do it later, throw caution to the winds, have fun. And Rob, we really enjoy your apps, your um, podcasts, and uh, using it on your app is always much better. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for the feedback. And we'll summarize this at the end about what my recommendations are. Uh, and back to the email bag. Here we go. Uh, hi, Rob. Per iOS 11, UI is really slow. Not as snappy as iOS 10. I have an iPhone 6S, 64 meg, 295 64-bit only apps. I manually deleted 32-bit apps. Started with 8 gig of free and ended up with 25 gig free. How's that? I applied the update via iTunes and performing a full backup to disk. No problems at all. Everything works just right. Nothing has crashed so far, but the UI is not snappy. It's slow. I'm really expecting i 11.0.1 to fix this anytime soon because this is not the way to oblige us to upgrade the hardware. Regards, Fabio E. And then again from Fabio. Hi, Rob. All right. I guess I spoke too soon. Snappiness returned after half an hour or so. I guess the OS was settling down a bit for doing some homework in the background because it is as fast as ever by now. I like it. Regards, Fabio E. So, folks, just a little note there. If you upgrade to iOS 11, you might see a little sluggishness and then it might go away. And then another from Fabio. Hi, Rob. I'm glad to have the TII app for your podcast because the official podcast app in iOS 10, 11 has a bug. It auto adds the current playing podcast episode as the next one to be played as well. If I try to delete it by swiping left, a long swipe, just, just the red bar remains without deleting the next episode. Regards, February. And then, hey, why not? One more from Fabio. Hi, Rob. Well, the podcast app crashed when I was trying to sort a list of audio episodes from different shows in the next list. Also, I can't find the option to mark episodes as played or unplayed, something I use frequently. Also, there seems to be something weird with the free space. Before upgrading to 11, I had about 8 gig free, then upgraded with iTunes, and at the end, I had 25 gig free. It's a 64 gig iPhone 6S. I just took some 1080p videos consuming about 10 gig and the settings app states there are 15 gig free. Just consistent that's consistent until iOS warned me about the iPhone running out of disk space 1.3 gig free only, which is weird. I then checked with other sysinfo apps, Lyrium and BMSSM and they say it's 1.8 gig free. Finally, the UI snappiness was temporary. I mean, it's usually snappy, but frequently an app takes an extra couple of seconds to start or to react to my typing, which is annoying to say the least. It, I don't uh, close apps. I just leave them in the background and only about 40% of them have the privileges to run in the background. Guess I'll have to disable that privilege for some of the other apps. Regards, Fabio E. Well, Thank you, Fabio E, for filling out our Fabio E section of today's episode. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. I hope your travels are going well and you are having a great time at the events you attend. Well, thank you. Uh, okay, after seeing so many on Google+, Plus who have already installed iOS 11 with no major issues, I decided to take the plunge and install it on my iPhone 6 Plus. I have only been playing with the new OS for a couple of hours, but here are a few initial impressions. Some transitions seem a bit jerky, where, as before, everything was very smooth and fluid. When swiping up to close an app, for instance, going back in the menu or tapping on the app to open it, there also seems to be a slight hesitation in performing tasks, and there's a slight delay, making the functionality seem a bit slower. This may be due in part 
to the fact that I'm using an older iPhone, but it is still a bit annoying. One pleasant surprise that I found has to do with the larger text. As a visually impaired user, I need larger and bolder text up until now. However, the larger fonts and numbers appeared only in certain places, but now there is a larger number of locations that the larger text appears, such as in the native mail app, in all the settings menus, and even in third-party apps. It is truly helpful feature and I also noticed that the phone dial pad has bolder and larger numbers as well. Thank you, Apple. Another nice touch is the dictation feature on the keyboard. Although I still tend to stop before I'm done dictating, it now at least leaves the box at the bottom so you can start right it right up again with a dedicated keyboard button on the right that you can also tap when you're finished dictating and want to return to the keyboard. I love the new layout of the control center and the ability to customize it, even if only a bit. I did gain an extra six or seven gig of space after the update too. I will probably discover other likes and dislikes as I go along, but these are the few little things I've run into so far. I have my home button set to triple click and invert the colors from black text on white to white text on black. This feature used to be instantaneous, but now when I triple click, there's a weird blank gray screen that appears for a couple of seconds in between the transition. It's annoying. LOL. What are some things you guys have noticed regards Tammy? Well, Tammy, thank you for the feedback. And uh, folks, I've, I've heard all the feedback now. Uh, and there is more, and I didn't go over it. And, and here's my quick summary of who should and should not upgrade to iOS 11. If you're a blind user and need Braille support, per Daryl earlier in the show, and a few others, do not upgrade to I yet to iOS 11. Um, if you need the, your iPhone for work, especially if you are mobile a lot, do not upgrade to iOS 11. If there are any mission-critical third-party apps on your iPhone or iPad that you need for work or school, hold off upgrading until you contact the devs to confirm there are no conflicts. And I would recommend right now going to the iOS app store and look at the latest reviews from those key apps that you have to use. And that should tell you if there are issues, but either way, go to the devs website. If they are halfway decent, they have a post up there on the site saying the status of their app in iOS 11. For everyone else, it is your call. I still recommend you wait until iOS 11.0.2. I will not be up updating my wife's iPhone until then, that's for sure. The only exception to what I just said there about waiting is those that have an iPad Pro. Those folks, I recommend you update as soon as you can. The majority of the best new features in iOS 11 are focused on the iPads, and more specifically, the iPad Pros. Yes, I tend to be overly conservative in my recommendations on upgrading to a new OS, but if all is working fine and you don't have an iPad Pro, not seeing the risk-reward validation here to upgrade right now. For now, keep the hounds locked up. That's my general recommendation. Before we close down, I do want to give my experiences with my Apple Watch Series 3. I received my Apple Watch Series 3 as scheduled on the 22nd. You can see our unboxing video in the TI app right now between episodes 441 and 442. And let me tell you about my Apple Watch 3 experience so far. Um, and what better way to tell you than via a phone call from my new Apple Watch. Initially, I had some issues trying to activate my Apple Watch Series 3. It was about four or five attempts, and it finally went through and activated fine. It cost me an additional $10 a month via T-Mobile, or $50 a month if each of the failed activations get charged to my account. But in theory, it'll be an additional $10 a month and it was pretty easy activation process if you don't count the multiple attempts, but I am assuming that was a server issue on T-Mobile side, having to handle the heavy influx of new Apple Watch Series 3 users, all trying to activate on Friday evening. T-Mobile did say the first three months are free, so that was nice. Battery life for my Apple Watch Series 3 has been incredible. I took it off the charger at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, at 9 p.m. Saturday evening, it was at 81% charge remaining. 
At 11 p.m. that evening, I removed it and placed it on the nightstand and put it back on around 9 a.m. on Sunday. Still not charging it, and at 7 p.m. on Sunday, it had 54% of the charge left. For it to make it through two full days and one night is really, really impressive. I'll be traveling this week, so we will see how well it holds up to lots of calls and being really mobile. But so far, I'm pretty much blown away by the battery life. And yes, again, mine is the LTE version. That gives you a feel there of the voice quality from the Apple Watch right on my wrist. Again, not using Bluetooth, just speaking right into the Apple Watch. It sounds as good as any other phone calls we get in, so I actually thought the audio quality is pretty good. Again, it is limited in audio quality versus what you hear me recording and talking to you right now. But for a phone call, the audio quality uh, for a voicemail message that I got back, I thought it was very good. Okay, we're going to end that part there. I'm going to actually continue on with listener feedback on episode 443. And there's some other items and listener feedback we're not going to get to, a lot of listener feedback we're not going to get to on today's episode. i got a couple of other items here I want to go through, and then I'll, I'll wrap up this episode. And again, episode 443, which will be out probably on the 30th or 29th, late 29th or 30th, uh, late on either one of those two days. And we'll continue back with a lot more listener feedback on that episode. On the last episode, I said the following, quote, iOS 11 will be released on September 19th, and by the October 5th, it will have been installed on at least 35% of all iOS devices and likely over 40% of all iOS devices based on past year's adoption rates. This versus the less than 0.1% for Android in the similar time period. Which one do you want to develop for? Unquote. Seems innocent enough, or so I thought. Then I got this email. Quote, Rob, why, oh, why? I have been a huge and loyal fan of the show since the early days, but now it's time to leave. I can't be the only OS agnostic listener you have. As a cross-platform app developer and support specialist, I keep up to speed on all the mobile OSs. With your show being an important part of that process, I have grown used to your barbed critique of the competition. It always seemed to be in good jest, but the sneering smugness when reporting the uptake of Android's latest offering was fanboying at its worst. So one less listener won't mean a thing, but it made me feel better to letting you know regards Andrew, unquote. Oh, some Android fanboys just don't get it. First, the beginning of the episode, the Hey Kool-Aid clip, it, it's to let you know, yes, I, I drank the apple Kool-Aid. But that in no way lessens the reality of what I said, And for the record, my barbs at Android are not just in jest. They are serious barbs calling out serious issues. Again, Android's latest and greatest version, Oreo, by their own stats, Google's own stats, had less than 0.1% uptake a few weeks after release. And please picture me sneering as I said those words. Now I'll switch into smugness mode. iOS 11, by the way, reached 10% uptake in 24 hours, and that is over 100 times the percent uptake in less than 1 20th of the time versus Oreo. Again, which platform, if you are a dev, do you want to develop for? And if those facts and comments offended you, Hey, Kool-Aid! Oh, yeah. Well, then maybe you need a drink. Just remember, what show you're listening to, and hopefully my sneering and smugness will not offend you. There is an article, I guess you call it, in the Chicago Tribune by Stephen Chapman. The title of this article is, quote, The iPhone X proves the Unabomber was right, unquote. This is link bait at its worst. Saying a murderer and anti-technology terrorist was somehow vindicated by the iPhone X is not just wrong, it's stupid and irresponsible on the part of the Chicago Tribune even letting this BS get out there. The article starts off with a quote from the Unabomber saying, the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race, unquote. How exactly does the iPhone 10 validate that comment or anything else from the Unabomber? For most people in the world, technology has allowed them to not just live a longer life, but to have one to start with. Look 
at life expectancies now and those prior to the Industrial Revolution. For a little more on that, most of the gains have to do with surviving childhood, something the Industrial Revolution clearly helped with. The Unabomber was deranged and evil. The iPhone 10 in no way, shape, or form proves he was right at all. For them to say so is at best total incompetence and at worst a desperate link bait ploy. Mr. Chapman, I want to say a few names to you. Hugh Scruton, Thomas Moser, Gilbert Murray. Those are the three people killed by the Unabomber. Go ahead and tell their families to their face that the iPhone 10 proved their family member's killer was right. Boo Steve Chapman for writing this BS and boo Chicago Tribune for allowing it to be published. This belongs in a post on a Tumblr or blogger or a comment on a forum board along with 9-11 conspiracies, not something on the Chicago Tribune. Ever, have you asked Siri how old are you? This is one of those multiple answer Siri things that you like to add at the end of each item. Regards, Stephen near Houston. P.S. Our house did not get flooded despite my rain gauge getting 45 inches of rain in four days, which is what we normally get in a whole year. By the way, Houston area got enough rain in a week to run Niagara Falls for 14 days. Well, Stephen, this is one I have not asked yet. Thanks for the suggestion and very glad to hear your home was not flooded and glad to hear you're okay. How old are you? I'm as spry as a slice of young ginger. How old are you? I feel like I was incepted yesterday. How old are you? I'm old enough to be your assistant. How old are you? Well, the humans have certainly aged me. That's for sure. How old are you? I'm as old as the eastern wind and as young as a newborn caterpillar. How old are you? I'm 45,980 years old in the ninth dimension. How old are you? I don't see why that should matter. How old are you? A virtual assistant never reveals its age. Today's show was again brought to you by Link AKC, which is an amazing new dog collar. It is a GPS locator, fitness tracker, and more designed to help keep your dog safe, happy, and healthy. Plus, it looks great. Go to linkakc.com and use code TII to save 30% on your order and get free shipping. That's code TII to save 30% on your order and free shipping at linkakc.com. And before we go today, I want to remind you to send in your feedback to show 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moondog. Or record your feedback and email to the show at todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment for something you said on someone said on this episode. It can be a question rant you have about something else, an app, a product review, good or bad. As long as it's iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature on the show that you've created on this device. Just put some TI branding on it and send it in. And of course, we are looking for more music created on iOS device to play on the show. The sure show and your feedback is greatly desired. I'll be doing a lot of traveling next six weeks. Uh, New Orleans, LA, New York City, Winnipeg. I will do my best to stay on the 7 to 10. I know I missed on this one, but I will get back as close as I can. Actually, we'll, we'll uh, get the next one up here and probably about five or six days. Your feedback will help with that. So please email, voicemail, send in your thoughts on iOS 11, tips and tricks and questions, anything about your iPhone 8 and 8 Plus that you love or hate, plus anything on the Apple Watch, your new Apple TV. Your feedback um, from the September 12th event, anything that's about that happened this month, we will love it and get it on the show. So please don't worry about burying me with it. Send in more and we'll get it out. And also, don't forget to check out our moderated Google Plus community by going to todayinios.com slash community. A quick reminder, if you are an app dev or an iBook author, email me if you want your app or iBook featured on the promo giveaway segment for free. We just need the five promo codes or more to give away. Simply email me at todayinios at gmail.com and please include a 60-second or less audio review of your app or iBook. And again, you are the dev or the author. Also, when sending in the promo codes, please make sure to let me know when they expire. Thanks again to RX Bar for sponsoring this episode. Folks, go right now to rxbar.com slash TII and use promo code TII at checkout to save 25% off your first order. And finally, check out the newly updated TII app, which is free to you. Search for TII in the iTunes App Store. It is the best way to consume the show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of TII is released. And of course, it is fully voiceover friendly. Well, that is it. Until the next time, I'm your host, Rob, reminding you to phone different. 
This show is hosted on Libsyn.com and part of the Wizard Media Network. If you are looking for hosting, go to Libsyn.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, for hosting for your podcast and for creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can also be found on the free Stitcher radio app. Just search for T-I-I. Hello, Rob. It's Paul in Lawrenceville, and uh, I thought I would call and answer to your request in podcast 441 about ordering. I won't go into all the details, but um, for me, in the Eastern Time Zone, things came alive on the Apple Store app at 12.01, and my Alti was ordered by 12.02 or 3.01, so it was 12.02 Pacific Time. I already had the order locked in, and it'll be in my mailbox on Friday, they say. Uh, That's next Friday, the 22nd. A couple of interesting things in the ordering process. When is something pre-order or ordered? Uh, The iPhone 8 popped up, of course, as the first choice, and it said pre-order. And right beneath it was the Apple Watch. Oh, I called it an Alti. I guess you're wondering, what does that mean? A-W-L-T-E. I ordered an Apple Watch with LTE. So I think we've got a new nickname, the Alti Watch, as opposed to the Alti, which would be uh, just the Wi-Fi watch um, without cellular. But here's the interesting thing about the ordering. When you scroll down to the Apple Watch, it just said order, not pre-order. So I think that may be a hint on supply, or just maybe a typo on the webmaster's part, but um, lead time shouldn't be as bad. Now, what I ordered was the 42 millimeter um, aluminum case, and uh, I think it comes with some kind of sports wrap, uh, like a NATO band is what we call it in the watch world. But I'm going to keep my Milanese and just move it over from my... Apple Watch 1 to the Apple Watch 3. Uh, A couple of things shifting gears uh, on what you mentioned and some of the callers. Uh, I do agree about the iPhone X or 10 uh, being different. It's an anniversary edition and it's a different size. It's totally different. And for the callers that noticed uh, visually impaired callers, noticed that it'll be harder to use. This is true. It's an anniversary edition. It's really no better or worse than the iPhone 8 or 8 Plus, uh, except for a few little features. And those features don't really matter to a visually impaired person. That's my opinion. I am not visually impaired. I have many family members who are. And the home button is important for orientation. You know, that you got the phone right side up. You should know where things are and you use voiceover, then it's the iPhone 8. There are certain Samsung phones that aren't user-friendly for visually impaired, and I think now we have the first uh, Apple iPhone that's not useful for visually impaired people. But it is an anniversary edition. I don't know if I'm going to order it. Um, It is probably the phone. I'm just speculating here but it is probably the phone that we heard the rumors about where there was some supply problems. And I'm guessing those supply problems had something to do with construction, especially around that tight-fitting bezel or the surrounding surgical stainless steel, I think is what they said, Phil said, uh, band and water resistance. Those are things that are not easy to accomplish. And I'll leave you with one thought. It's sort of a straying off path here. But my only interaction with Steve Jobs was 10 years ago, or actually more like 10 years and six months ago, when I was working for a carrier that owned half of Singular. And we saw that we finally were given the specs. And my email, just as an end user, was... Why don't we make the next one water resistant? Now, I got a reply, which was unusual. Don't know if it was an assistant. And all it said was, it's not in the roadmap. So I guess the roadmap was long, 10 years long, as it turned out, 
where we finally have an Apple phone that is water resistant, um, which is no mean feat. It can be done as others have already done it. But uh, I thought that was interesting. So anyway, keep up the good work. That was my ordering experience with an Apple Watch. Uh, I'm sure other people will have different experiences with the iPhone as lead times span out. But I got my confirmation email back from Apple at uh, 3.03 Eastern Time, which would be 12.03 Pacific. Hope that helps. Enjoy podcasts and keep them coming.